you are a conduit to every organization that you're connected to, and so many attacks will start with you in your personal life and then move to the company. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, so I've been in security industry for about two decades now, and in that time I've given a lot of talk, and security talks tend to be about scaring people, and the common narrative is something to the effect of the attackers are getting much worse, and they're breaking into your devices, and they're breaking into the government, and they're breaking into the banks, and your reaction is normally like, that's actually pretty scary, but it doesn't directly affect me. So the good news is I'm not going to be giving that talk, but the bad news is I'm going to be talking about how en masse attackers are moving from these traditional targets of companies uh, and of systems and actually are focusing on, on you. And actually, we think this is one of the biggest shifts in the entire industry, and we think that it impacts everybody in this audience. This isn't just for investors. This isn't just for people in the security industry. So to start, let's do what VCs do best and try and understand the trend by following the money. Security is an enormous industry. All of these logos are security companies. VCs typically pump billions of dollars into security every year. In 2018, it was about 5.3 billion. That has nothing to do with, like, for example, public markets, which also is a tremendous amount more investment. And the thing you should know is the vast majority of these logos and the vast majority of this effort are building technologies to protect devices and to protect companies. And if you look at how much industry spends, it's also an enormous amount of money. So estimated in like, this year, over $100 billion will be invested in cybersecurity from, from large companies. And this is security personnel, this is technologies, this is the creation of secure devices. Independent companies spend a tremendous amount of money on security. So, for example, J.P. Morgan Chase alone will estimate about $600 million in cybersecurity. And Microsoft will spend over a billion dollars in security. Now, Microsoft is an interesting example here because they're both a company that needs to protect its assets, but also they create devices. And if you look at the security spend to protect devices, it's actually very significant, and it's raised the bar a lot on how hard it is to break into your device. So when I first started doing computing in the 90s, it was a very different story. I remember you used to be able to buy a PC, you'd take it home, you'd install Windows, and by the time it was actually installed, you'd been compromised, literally. So <laughs> like, you couldn't even use it before you'd been compromised. This is just no longer the case. If you were to buy on the black market an exploit to break into a phone, for example, an Android phone, it costs about $2.5 million if it doesn't require the participation of the user. If you wanted to break into an iPhone, it's about $2 million. If you wanted to buy an exploit that required the participation of the user, like them clicking on a link, it's about a $1 million. But the point is, there's a lot of money required to break into devices. And you know, if companies are spending hundreds of millions, it actually takes a lot of money to break into them as well. So if you think about you know, this mass expenditure of dollars, compare that to the median price a person in this room spends on their personal security, which is zero dollars. And this has caused a shift on the attackers away from what's become relatively difficult targets to fairly easy targets. And it just turns out that targeting you is both incredibly cheap, which I'll talk about in a second, but also insanely profitable. One of the reasons it's profitable is because, okay, like all of your finances are online, but another reason it's, it's profitable is you are a conduit to every organization that you're connected to. And so many attacks will start with you in your personal life and then move to the company. Let's take a moment to try and quantify how much it costs for me to like, attack you. So these numbers are taken from the dark web. Let's just assume they're directionally correct. So in order for me to, for example, take over your Gmail account, it costs about 100 bucks. So what can I get from, from attacking your Gmail account? Well, if you're anything like me, listen, I've had the same personal email account for 20 years, and it is a museum of my past, right? It's my academic past, it's my personal past, it's my professional past, it's my financial past. And not only that, the vast majority of my online accounts are attached to this email, right? So for example, if I sign up for a new account, I put my email address, and if you want to, like, say, change the password, all you have to do that is from the email, right? So it's not very hard, and it's not expensive compared to, say, $2 million to break into an iPhone to actually compromise someone's personal account. To get a sense of how big of a business this has become, it's enormous. So business email compromise alone is estimated to be about a $26 billion a year 
business for attackers. So what is business email compromise? All it is is me being able to send you an email that will get you to send money to some place that's not legitimate, right? It's just a way of funneling email. It often happens by targeting people's personal accounts. Um, it tends to not be like this like, low-level hacky stuff. It's literally just socially engineering. And you start digging into who are the targets of things like, say, business email compromise or ransomware, they tend to be the companies that don't spend a tremendous amount of money on security, right? So, Listen, financial services is somewhere in the middle. That has like all of the world's assets, and it's not a top target. Uh, IT companies tend to be the largest company in the world, clearly have a lot of assets at the very bottom. And so the attackers are going to where the money tends not to be. And what becomes even more surprising is you dig into like, what is the actual demographic? So the vast majority of these type of attacks are focused on small to medium businesses which really is anybody with a home office. So, for example, my father is a retiree in Arizona. He has a translation business to keep himself occupied. He's been the subject of many of these types of attacks. Right? So really, like, the attacks en masse, tens of billions of dollars, are focusing on individuals. One of my favorite kind of depictions of this trend is the Google Transparency Report. So as we know, Google scans the entire web, and as part of that, they try and classify websites like bad websites. And they classify them in two ways. There's the bad websites in blue, and those are kind of the hacky ones that try and like, break into your browser or break into your OS. And then there are the um, phishing sites, which are in the orange. So phishing sites don't have any sort of malicious code. Normally, what they're meant to do is just to trick you into like, assuming it's a bank so you reveal uh, your credentials, or maybe you think it's, it's Gmail so you reveal your credentials. So if you look 10 years ago, clearly the majority of sites were just these bad malware sites. If you look five years ago, it was about 50-50. But look what happened in just the last year. So there are almost no like, hacky sites, malware sites left, and almost all of that is phishing, which are literally sites targeted to trick you as an individual into revealing your credentials. So to now, what I've described, I'm like, OK, listen, like, lots of money spent in cybersecurity, lots of money to be made. Those that are trying to make the money are moving where the dollars are less spent. By the way, you, again, spend zero dollars on yours, um, and then focusing on the individuals. I'd like to drill down a little bit deeper and talk about very specific attacks that we see a lot of. So the first one I want to talk about is a SIM port attack. It's a very prevalent, incredibly devastating attack. Uh, it happens quite often. My favorite accounting of this is done by a guy named Sean Kuntz. He wrote a Medium post. If you haven't read it, I recommend you do. Uh, and he lost $100,000 to a SIM port attack. You may have heard this as SIM swapping or SIM jacking. So I'm going to describe what this attack is. It's actually very straightforward. So when you sign up for an online account, you know, often they say, listen, to make you more secure, give us your cell phone number. And that way, if you do something like reset your password, then we will send you an SMS, and then you give us a little pin code, and then we know it's you. So on the face of this, it sounds pretty secure. But the problem is, it's not very hard for an attacker to convince a telco to move your phone number to their phone. So much so, it's actually mandated by the government to, to make this easy. So in the case of Sean Coots, an attacker probably went into a retail outlet, maybe had a fake ID, or maybe just knew personal information about Sean Coots, was able to move the phone number from his device to the attacker's device. And once I have that, let's assume that it's attached to the personal email, I can now reset the password on your personal email, and then the attacker was able to go in and then use that to reset the password for the financial accounts and then drain the account. So if you think I'm cherry-picking Go to Twitter and look up Simport. This is a super prevalent attack. In fact, uh, Jack Dorsey, if you know his Twitter account was taken over, this was done via Simport. Remember, this is a CEO of two public companies. And as far as we know, I mean, the attacker just you know, said nonsense on Twitter, uh, but I think he's actually pretty lucky to have had an attacker that's relatively unambitious, uh, to be honest. OK, so this may seem like a little bit of a technicality. In order to pull off this attack, I've got to, like, you know, uh, uh, work with like a telco to move the number. It's actually not. So the general rubric of these attacks is if I'm able to convince you to give me a pin code only you know in any way, I can attack you. So I'm going to walk through another attack, which kind of shows how easy this is. So this is from Peter Guntz, digital lawyer, clearly not technically naive. He got a phone call from the bank. And the phone call said, listen, somebody's trying to use your card in Florida. Was this you? So I don't know about you. I get these phone calls all the time. You don't want this. They're saying, listen, we're going to lock your account. We need to make sure it's you so we can unlock the account. 
So he says, listen, that's not me. And they said, okay, let's, let's go ahead and verify you. What's your member number? So the attacker is now getting the member number. You can't do anything with a member number because it's not a secret, but they get it. And then the attacker <laughs> does, is the attacker goes and issues a password reset on that member number. That SMS goes to Peter Gunst, and then the attacker on the phone says, okay, we just need to really make sure it's you because we don't want to unlock your account if it's not you. And then can you read this SMS message we sent you? Peter Gunst reads it off, and then the attacker has access to the actual transactions. That's how they gain legitimacy, and the next step that they do is they will ask for your PIN number. Again, the point of this is not these specific attacks. The point is it's actually incredibly difficult if you're being focused from a social engineering attack to protect your own private accounts. And the last two attacks I've talked about have really been focused on individuals, but as I mentioned before, the individuals tend to be the entree to broader attacks on businesses. Actually, probably one of the most notorious large breaches of a tech company in Silicon Valley happened this way, and it started with something as innocuous as a barbecue. So there's a company barbecue, the group went to the barbecue. Um, after the barbecue, somebody sent an email. They said, listen, great barbecue. They had insider knowledge about that. You know, if you click on this link, you'll get the photos from the barbecue. Now, all of us know not to click on links. I know not to click on a link, but like this is photos from a barbecue that somebody knows. Like, I mean, I would have clicked on it. That, of course, led to a phishing site, which led to implanting of malware, which led to a broad breach, which went basically for the core IP and the jewels of the company. The level of sophistication that we're seeing actually knows no bounds. Here's another one. So <laughs> this one literally hits close to home because it happened in my, the city that I live. Um, and so the victim here worked in finance, and somebody infiltrated their cleaning crew at their personal residence. This isn't at work, at their personal residence. The person that infiltrated their cleaning crew then gained access to a laptop. Doesn't matter how secure you are, if I have physical access to your laptop, I can probably break in. This was used to implant malware and then that malware was used to basically change routing numbers on legitimate invoices to shift money away. Again, this was a residence. Now, listen, I'll tell you, I, uh, I used to work for the intelligence community from 2001 to 2003. These were the type of attacks that we would see um, you know, nation states do to each other. Like, I had no idea that this type of things would like, start happening down the street, but it actually is happening today. The good news is I also had no idea that things at the time were kind of really enterprise-grade security would get consumerized. So, for example, everybody in this audience can use them. And so for the rest of the talk, I want to focus, which we believe is an actual renaissance, in the security industry. So there are solutions to pretty much every one of these attacks that's very simple to use, so much so, if you don't use them, like, I kind of view you as a bit of an anti-vaxxer. <laughs> And the reason is, is like, you are the attack service for your company, and they're going to help you with the company assets. But if you don't take care of your own kind of digital personal life, the company will lose herd immunity. So that, I'm going to walk through um, a few very simple product categories. You've probably heard this before, but it's very important that you realize that if you implement these basic steps, you are pretty close to immune for every one of the attacks that I've listed. So just bear with me, and we'll go through these. Um, <laughs> and increasing levels of sophistication. OK, let's start with a device. So back in the late 90s, when I bought a device, like I told you, by the time the operating system was installed, it'd be compromised. That's just not the case today. There are very, very secure devices you can buy. Probably the most secure, we think, is a Google Chromebook. So if you look at a Google Chromebook, I mean, it uses hardware to store keys. It uses hardware attestation. It does auto patching. It encrypts by default. It has a lot of content stored in the cloud. It's very difficult for an attacker remotely to break into one of these devices. Apple devices tend to be pretty secure. This year, they've had some vulnerabilities, but in general, pretty secure. I use Apple devices. They're fine as well. But the point is, there's no excuse for using an insecure device today. So you should really understand the security posture of what you're using. And if it tends not to be the top, you should use the top. The next best practice is the password manager. Like, passwords just aren't going away. I wish they would, but they're not. I have, I don't know, 100 online accounts, and every one of those accounts requires a different password. There's just no humanly way possible for me to remember all of those. One of the most common attacks against people like you in the audience, honestly, the most common attacks is password reuse. You're like, oh, my garden club, you know, I'm going to use this password, and that's the same password that you use for something more secure. So an attacker that breaks into your garden club can you reuse that password for the more secure one. So I was actually talking to our CISO, uh, Joel De La Garza, so he was the CISO of Box previously, and he says to his knowledge of even the nation states attacks that we know about in the last couple of years, all but two of them used password reuse as the, uh, the initial entry. 
There's a very simple way to stop password reuse, is just use a password manager. They're tremendously well integrated, they're very simple to use, and what they do is they manage your passwords, they create unique secure passwords, and they reduce it to one very difficult to guess password that you can protect physically. Okay, the next thing that you should know about are security keys. So security keys are probably the only 100% effective mechanism against account takeover. So a security key is very much like a physical key. The way a security key works is, um, like, so like a physical key. So in order to get to your house, you need to have the key to put it in the door or in the car. A security key is the same thing for an online account. So let's talk about some of the attacks that I've said before. Let's say uh, password reuse. Let's say you just happen to reuse a password. Even if I knew that password, I still couldn't get in your account unless I got your physical key. Or let's talk about SIM porting. Even if I ported your phone number and I got that little SMS pin, I still couldn't get in your account unless I have that physical key. So, you know, it's interesting. Security keys are actually a consumer phenomenon. It started on the consumer side, not on the enterprise side, but it's now seeing a lot of adoption in the enterprise. Uh, there's an actually pretty famous case study where Google rolled them out uh, wall to wall. So every Google employee has a security key. They had account takeover issues, you know, six years ago. Over six years of using them, account takeover went to zero. My recommendation to you, get it and use it minimally for your personal email, and maximally if you use a password manager, use it to protect the password manager. This is what's called a canary from a company called Things Canary. So a canary is a deception device. So what is deception? So deception is where you put a device on your network that looks like a vulnerable system, but really isn't. And the goal is to kind of lure the attackers out to attack it. Like if somebody is going to be talking to one of these devices, it's not the, the, the source is not legitimate because the device is basically not legitimate. Now, deception has been around for a very long time. Like, I used it when I, I was working for the intelligence community. But what's so remarkable about this is, like, you can buy these on the web and you can install them, and they're incredibly effective. So, for example, I have one in my home network. I do not have a sophisticated home network. I really don't. I have a four-bedroom house, <laughs> you know. But in there, I have a Nest, a Sonos, Apple TV, an Oculus, a Nintendo Switch, and I have no idea even though I've been a security person, if any of those things are compromised. And so, you know, Things Canary is such an interesting company as far as like articulating this trend, which you've got a relatively small company out of South Africa that sells these basically over the web. And if you look at the logo list, it's like every sophisticated uh, logo that you know uses these. They have over 700 customers, and yet they're simple enough for you and I to buy over the web and install. So it just goes to show you to what level sophisticated security is being consumerized, and you should know about it. OK, I have to make the point that just because you use sophisticated digital security doesn't mean that you can forget about physical security, and arguably it becomes much more important. Why? So let's go through the, the, the defenses I talked about. The secure laptop. It doesn't matter how secure your laptop is. If somebody get physical access, they can almost certainly break into it, right? Remember, we were talking about Mission Impossible Suburbia? That was physical access to a, a device. If you write down your master password for your password manager, and somebody has it, they can break in. If somebody steals your security key, they can break in. So we'd recommend something as like anachronistic as a safe for any sort of like backup keys or passwords, et cetera. So talking about physical security, right now we believe we're in a bit of a renaissance for digital security. Um, from a consumerization standpoint, we actually think kind of a next wave that we're very interested in is improvements in physical security. So this is a video from Ambient. And they build smart security cameras. So these cameras are incredibly sophisticated when it comes to determining threats. So for example, it can watch like, your body posture and how you walk and uniquely identify individuals. So say someone is trying to infiltrate your cleaning crew, it would know about that. But even beyond that, it can do things like malicious action detection. So it can determine, are you brandishing a weapon? Is there an assault going on? Is someone stealing something? Is someone casing a joint? And while today these are primarily being used by corporate offices, more and more we're actually seeing them pop up in residences. So if you want a little bit of a glimpse into a future, an area we're very excited about and one to watch, we definitely think physical security is one of them. OK, so with that said, we published a, a blog post that details this and a number of others. Every one of you should be able to implement these things. They will make a big, big difference in your online security. And I would say, in conclusion, don't be that guy. <laughs>